when any movement abandons a commitment that is foundational to its very self, profound problems follow. In 1998, a little more than a year after the Labour Party had won a landslide general election victory after 18 years in opposition, the Secretary of State for Trade and Industry, Peter Mandelson, was on a visit to California's Silicon Valley. He told a group of computer executives that he was intensely relaxed about people becoming filthy rich as long as they pay their taxes. That short phrase, intensely relaxed, has long haunted the now Lord Mandelson, for it seems to encapsulate the way in which a socialist political party had strayed from its founding narrative. This evening, I want to argue that the church is often intensely relaxed about a profound way in which it routinely strays from its founding narrative. And that concerns the way in which we approach our inevitable disagreements, both within and also beyond the church. In a world, as Paul has said, where polarization is so evidently a problem, there is a particular irony here because the church has lost sight of a set of ethical attributes that should be at the very heart of Christian witness. This lecture draws on the work done for my doctorate in Christian ethics at the University of Oxford, but that only began as a result of a clear sense of call away from my work as the religious affairs correspondent for the BBC World Service and into ordained ministry. So as someone who has seen church conflict up close as a journalist and subsequently studied some of the underlying theology, I am honored to be sharing these reflections this evening. Reflections on some of the teaching on disagreements that we find within the pages of the New Testament, and to ask what it might be for us to disagree in authentically Christian ways. We'll consider some of the key New Testament texts, and the references to those should appear in the Zoom chat uh, as I refer to them. I will then share the ethical rules that I'm proposing for Christians facing their disagreements. And then later on in the lecture, our gaze will turn outwards, drawing on some of John Stott's own wisdom about navigating our complex world in an authentically Christian way. And this notion of authentically or distinctly Christian is important as we begin. Within the church, we variously hear encouragements to good disagreement or disagreeing well. And no doubt, good disagreement is better than bad disagreement, and disagreeing well is better than disagreeing poorly. But I believe that loving disagreement is a distinctly, uniquely Christian call. It's a phrase that has been used occasionally by the current Archbishop of Canterbury including in the foreword, he contributed to a book on reconciliation in 2014, when he wrote, good and loving disagreement is a potential gift to a world of bitter and divisive conflict. My contention is that good disagreement can risk sounding like an end in itself and something with no particular theological grounding. Whereas to seek loving disagreement is to enter, if you like, into a kingdom-shaped oxymoron. In other words, something where two apparently contradictory terms are brought together, loving disagreement, and they only make sense together within a Christian anthropology. In my own reflections, Jesus' words to his disciples towards the end of John's gospel narrative have taken on a particular significance. And John 13.35 has become the foundational text for this work, linking together as it does both loving unity and mission. Jesus very simply says to that somewhat unpromising group of earliest followers, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So often the church operates as if Jesus had ended his own sentence in a rather different way. 
Now, this, of course, isn't the only way to understand how the church becomes attractive to those beyond it. But I do fear that we too often overlook the plain sense in which Jesus underlines that the church is attractive to those on the outside when they can see the love that exists within it. And of course, later in John's gospel, famously in John 17, this loving unity is at the very heart of Jesus's prayers for his followers throughout history. And so from verse 20, we read, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This is a powerful message from Jesus in John's gospel. And this Johannine call to loving unity within the body of Christ is also powerfully expressed in two other key images within that gospel, those offered by foot washing and the vine. It's worth noting that just before Jesus tells his disciples, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another, Arguably, he has just shown them a way of revealing the same through his wildly countercultural decision to wash his disciples' feet. And while this incident is rightly often interpreted in relation to Jesus' humble servant leadership, it also reveals the kind of community the church is called to be. So at John 13 from verse 12, we read, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. One of the themes we will keep returning to is that across the New Testament, its writers do not merely commend right belief. They are repeatedly and routinely concerned by the actions and crucially the moral character of those who follow the way of Christ. And then the vine in John chapter 15 offers a crucial and sometimes inconveniently uncomfortable reminder of the deep interconnectedness of all those who call themselves Christians. From John chapter 15 verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Now, of course, this imagery of the vine is painfully clear about the need to remain faithful if one is to bear fruit. My concern this evening is not about how one adjudicates whether someone has departed from Christian faith, but rather how fellow Christians facing a disagreement are called to proceed, and indeed what wisdom this offers to Christians facing disagreements in this workplace or another context beyond the church. So notice how this passage concludes from verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, here it comes again, love each other. Mutual love among Christians is a key feature 
of fruitful Christian life. Well, before we reach what in ethical terms one might call the rules I'm proposing for loving disagreement, there are three further areas I wish to mention. The facing of disagreement, the question of anger, and Christian speech ethics. Now, it would have been perfectly possible to base this whole lecture around the council at Jerusalem as recorded in Acts chapter 15, because it is a uniquely fascinating a moment within the New Testament texts in recording how an area of disagreement was faced and dealt with in the life of the early church, just what demands should be placed on new non-Jewish believers. And so from verse 6 of Acts 15, the apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles should hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. Well, I find it fascinating that Peter should highlight the receipt of the Holy Spirit as a particularly compelling and credible feature in the faith of Gentile converts. Notice, too, the place for the Spirit in the reaching of a decision. At verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the requirements that then follow. Here we see the church firstly unafraid to face a disagreement, unafraid to see this as a profoundly spiritual question. We see the emergence of early models of oversight and authority. And crucially, we see the church discerning together the will of God and moving forward in unity. Fascinatingly, in the very same chapter, we also come across what is in many Bible translations the only use in English of the word disagreement. From verse 36, some time later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, this doesn't appear to be a doctrinal disagreement, and we never learn of it being resolved. But we do learn that this is an example of a certain kind of disagreement, even one which leads to leaders parting company is not necessarily undermining the ultimate spread of the gospel. Now, no single incident of disagreement in scripture provides a template for how we might approach disagreements today, but there are fruitful observations to be made from incidents like this one. Another question that I'm often asked concerns anger, often rather simply put along the lines of, well, Jesus got angry, so why shouldn't I? My answer takes us to Ephesians chapter four, and that is the letter of Paul that we will return to at the end of the lecture. At the beginning of this particular chapter, notice the character attributes, the moral qualities that Paul is emphasizing. I urge you, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And then from verse 26, what I see as timeless biblical wisdom about anger. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not let the devil, do not give the devil a foothold. And finally, verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up 
according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Well, I think we can agree that the bar is set high here, and Paul leaves his hearers in no doubt about the qualities that should be associated with followers of Jesus. We might note that Jesus' anger is largely reserved for those religious leaders beyond the kingdom who are criticizing him. But the way of the kingdom itself moves beyond anger. Powerfully emphasized within the Beatitudes, this priority of love and mercy and even peacemaking. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And fascinatingly, this, of course, is immediately followed at Matthew 5, 13, by Jesus' reminder, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And we will return to the call to salty outreach uh, in a few minutes' time. The final area I want to touch on before sharing some of these proposed rules for Christian disagreement concerns what we might call Christian speech ethics, in particular the sustained concern for this outlined in the letter of James. There is for me a searing quality to the appeal made in chapter 3 from verse 9. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. James, of course, also offers us so many powerful visual images, not least the power of the tongue, despite its physical size. And then from verse 17, James considers the qualities of Christian wisdom, because the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. And it's not just James for whom this is a concern. Paul cautions Timothy in various ways. But in his second letter, avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Now, I'm not saying that verses such as these are entirely ignored in the contemporary church. But I am asking whether, in general, we give as much weight as the writers of the New Testament seem to expect to moral character and the way in which Christians are called to engage with one another. And for me, many of the strands that we've been considering thus far are drawn together in chapter three of the letter to the Colossians. So reading from verse 12, this really is a passage that speaks for itself, but how willing so often is the church to hear it. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The characteristics, the moral qualities of the people of God are a primary concern here. 
that doesn't mean that teaching and even admonishing is not significant, but it is held in this context of the praise of God, the seeking of the peace of Christ, and the celebration of virtues crowned ultimately with love. Well, with all those in mind, I want to share with you uh, what, within my published work on disagreement, I uh, rashly propose are four rules, or at least observations, to guide Christians who might be seeking to practice loving disagreement. And after we've considered uh, these references, uh, we will move on uh, to consider what this might all mean for Christian life on our particular front lines, not least with reference to the legacy of John Stott. So these rules for Christian loving disagreement uh, begin a chapter on in Colossians, Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. Well, I suspect in this audience there are many people who take close attention to scripture extremely seriously. So perhaps I don't need to point out specifically the word always here, but it isn't a different word <laughs> placed there. And so what might it be for us to seek to speak always uh, in a gracious way, but yet seasoned with salt, with a confident expectation that there may be knowledge about how others might be answered. Second, a more thematic approach, which is about pursuing recognizably godly speech. And also seeing that that speech, time after time in the New Testament, is seen to be inspired by God himself. So one example from Luke chapter 12 Jesus says, when you were brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. In the academic work I've done uh, on disagreement, one of my questions is whether the whole question of pneumatology and the role of the Holy Spirit is so often bracketed off uh, in the way in which we think uh, about the place uh, of Christian ethical discernment. But actually, time after time within the New Testament, we see people with a very high confidence in God's ability to speak through them and to therefore guide them into more authentically recognisable Christian speech. Now, Romans chapter 12 is another enormously rich passage of scripture. And of course, that chapter begins with the whole concept of offering one's body as a living sacrifice. And then later, in that context, if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. It may be that we look, whether across our family, our friendship groups, our workplace, or indeed our church, and feel that that seems like a naive hope. But what would it be for us to seek to implement some of these scriptures that we've been reflecting on together and seek, so far as it depends on us, to model the very peace of Christ in our communities. And finally, to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. Now, this references, of course, Galatians chapter 5, with its powerful and pointed contrast between the ways of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. But notice how many of these fruits straightforwardly map onto how someone might approach occasions of disagreement. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, we are reminded, there is no law. But how many of us manage to resist the temptation to press the button over as we hover uh, over a post or uh, email that could yet be more patient or gracious or kind. I use the word cultivate uh, with reference to the work of Joanna Collicutt, the uh, clinical psychologist turned theologian, 
uh, who writes on the psychology of Christian character for formation. And I love the way in which she uses the concept of the fruit of the spirit, thinking about the way in which a farmer uh, cooperates with the soil and the elements uh, in relation to the producing of a successful crop. Her point is that uh, there are certain things which are absolutely within the farmer's control and things which are the farmer's own responsibility. But the amount uh, of sunshine and rain is completely beyond uh, their control. And so they seek to participate in this act of cultivation. And I rather like that as a picture of how it is that we as independent rational beings are called to cooperate with God uh, as we seek more of the fruit uh, of the spirit in our lives. There are many things that we can choose to do but there is also a mysterious submission to the will and the presence uh, of God. And think for a moment uh, about the contexts in which so many of this, dis these disagreements uh, emerge in local churches, for example. I'm not necessarily thinking about grand uh, doctrinal discussions, but more which way should the chairs be put out? Or should the pews be replaced by chairs? Or dare we have this service at that radical new time half an hour later than we used to? Because we all know that these are the situations where it's not obvious that there is doctrinally, theologically, an obvious right answer compared to an obviously wrong answer. But we also know that these are the very discussions can, that can profoundly wound the church, that can profoundly poison the atmosphere within a particular fellowship. And the kinds of arguments that I've been making thus far are ones that I believe, if applied uh, in faith and hope and love, can genuinely make a positive difference in the life uh, of local churches. So these rules are offered as, if you like, guiding principles for the facing of disagreements, particularly in those initial moments when it's not yet obviously clear that this disagreement is going to face an inexorable downward spiral into an entrenched conflict. It seems to me that that is the moment in particular when, if we can learn to apply the fruit of the Spirit, to see the best uh, in the other person, there is still a possibility of avoiding an entrenched conflict. But of course, it's also important to consider how these principles can be a benefit to Christians as they look beyond uh, the life of the church, not least as we honor John Stott's vision in founding the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity. So our task is also to consider what it means for Christians to live as faithful witnesses in a world so undermined by polarization and toxic disagreement. Perhaps some of you in the past have seen those uh, bracelets that some Christians wear asking the question, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, in a sense, the final part of this lecture is uh, WWJSD, what would John Stott do? I have suggested this as a merchandising opportunity to LICC, but they haven't uh, bitten yet. Um, but I personally must say that I really admired John Stott's championing of gracious, patient engagement across divides, both within and beyond the church, always holding firm to Christian truth. Now, John Stott, of course, trained for ministry at Ridley Hall in Cambridge, where a later principal, Graham Cray, expressed its approach as roots down, walls down. I love that. Roots down, walls down. The depths of one's roots enables an open engagement, including with those with whom there is substantial disagreement. One might say that a rediscovery of such an approach is desperately needed both within and beyond the church today. So in this section, as we look towards the church in mission, I want to note three particular scriptural passages before ending with some final reflections rooted in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, described famously through the title of John Stott's commentary as God's New Society. 
So firstly, the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. Now, I'm sure you need little reminder about the various destinations of the seed, some along the path eaten by birds, some on rocky places without much soil where initial growth is followed by withering, some among thorns choked out of life, and some, of course, on the good soil producing much fruit. In this, I suggest we take into our public engagement, including our disagreements, a recognition that God is not surprised when not every good seed springs into instant and lasting life. But our task is freely to scatter, indeed to broadcast, good seed. And for me, that good seed must have within it those character attributes that we have already thought about in some detail. So in essence, what is it for Christians to scatter seed of the fruit of the spirit in their workplace, their local community, among their family, seeing this as profoundly part of gospel witness in a skeptical society? Second, I want to note two aspects of Jesus sending out of the 12 in Matthew chapter 10. From verse 16, we read, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. In other words, disciples are not called to be doormats, to be as shrewd as a snake, as well as innocent as a dove is no easy task. But note that when challenged, when confronting the difficulty of this, Jesus says, well, the difficulty will surely come, but you are not to worry, but rather to trust that the Holy Spirit will guide speech. And we might indeed also recall the encouragement of James to tame the tongue, the point being that in all of this, it is possible for the Christian to seek God's inspiration and guidance. What we cannot ignore is the fact that the Christian call is costly. So when Jesus says in Mark 8, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me, he's not exactly offering a walk in the park. But then he continues what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Yet again, we are called back to the question of not whether we are called to engage with wider society, but how are we called to engage? I already mentioned how striking it is that Matthew chapter 5 verse 13's appeal to saltiness comes immediately after the repeated blessings of the Sermon on the Mount. But I love the way John Stott himself uses this image to challenge the church about its wider social engagement. In this particular case, referring to the state of the media, he wrote, it's no good blaming them. When the meat goes bad, it's no good blaming the meat and the bacteria that are making the meat putrefy. It's the fault of the salt that's not there to stop it from going bad. And if the media have gone bad, so bad that we want to take our aerials out, who is to blame? Are you pointing the finger at them over there? I point the finger here. It's our fault. It's the fault of Christian people. If only we could be the salt of the earth as we were meant to be. We live in a time when the church risks being overwhelmed by introspection and when we need to discover afresh how best to engage wider culture. And I think a key element in this is rediscovering how to be both salty and genuinely gracious, loving and also truthful. On the front of my new book, I characterize this challenge as seeking truth, making peace 
and building unity. All three are important, and it's a problem if they're not held together in creative tension. Well, as I've mentioned, Paul's letter to the Ephesians represented for John Stott an invitation to God's new society. So I want to conclude by mentioning four short extracts that outline this distinctive, attractive, gracious Christian call. First, in Ephesians chapter two, we're reminded of the astonishing bringing together of Jew and Gentile. Verse 15 speaks of Jesus creating in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near. Well, how much does our church and our world need to be reminded of this foundational purpose of God's work to bring peace to those near and far? The following chapter has its glorious prayer for the Ephesians, appropriately reminding us of God's hope for his church. I do wonder if sometimes we can become rather downhearted or cynical or just deeply disappointed by human failure within the church. And yet, Paul writes from Ephesians 3 verse 20, famously, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And so much as we are right to celebrate and encourage LICC's ministry in reaching out, and I feel we should also honour Arosha's pioneering ecological ministry, we shouldn't lose sight of this promise of glory within the church at John Stott's beloved All Souls Langham Place and in many places beyond. And as I hope I've shown, when the church lives in the fullness of its calling, seeking unity and truth, fostering mutual love, it becomes once again the irresistibly attractive force it has so often been before. I fear that we so often lose sight of this, both because of our introspection, but also because we have stopped taking sufficiently seriously these calls to the fostering of mutual love, to the seeking of unity alongside truth. And then as Ephesians 4 from verse 14 onwards puts it, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Well, of course, one of the roundabout encouragements in relation to Christians and their disagreements is the fact that they are not hidden in the pages of the New Testament itself. Paul is by no means surprised by the challenges faced by so many of the churches with whom he corresponds. But there is a confident sense that it is possible to move beyond the stage of being tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching. The challenge is to speak the truth in love. And the question there, it often seems to me, is whether the person who is on the receiving end of having the truth spoken to them genuinely feels as though they are being spoken to in love. One may or may not wish to think about certain contemporary challenges that the church faces in this respect. 
But note Paul's ultimate confidence that the whole body joined together, held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. As I've already said, this doesn't mean that there are not boundaries for the life of the church, but it does mean that for those who are committed to staying within it, committed to seeking truth as well as unity, there is a delight in being part of an inherently diverse body, growing and building in love. And then in Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 15, a warning. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In our very worship, in our praise, at best we discover afresh from the heart what it is to live as those thankful for the gift of salvation. This, it seems, is the living out of a faith which requires the wisdom of a serpent and the innocence of a dove, but always ultimately as part of a body which is built up in love. Again, Paul is unsurprised by the days feeling evil, but the question for followers of Christ is whether they are to be foolish and drunk or instead to draw closer to the source of life itself. John Stott ends his commentary on Ephesians, noting that Paul begins and ends his letter with references to grace and peace. Grace and peace. Stott writes, no two words could summarize the message of the letter more succinctly. For peace, in the sense of reconciliation with God and one another, is the great achievement of Jesus Christ. And grace is the reason why and the means by which he did it. Moreover, both are indispensable to all members of God's new society. He then continues, it is a wish, a prayer, that the members of God's new society may live in harmony as brothers and sisters in his family, at peace and in love with him and with each other, together with a recognition that only by his grace can this dream come true. So what is it for us to seek to hold together this vision of grace and peace? I believe that we desperately need to be able to face our inevitable disagreements with a distinctly Christian hope, with a grace and peace that, as Paul puts it, comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. Our love of disagreement has too long been a problem. But as we seek and discover loving disagreement, we embrace an authentically Christian solution, which can be a genuine blessing, both for the church and for the wider world. Thank you very much. Yes, I mean, I, I suppose I remember growing up that there used to be those jokes about, you know, people in certain kinds of place buying their newspaper and putting it in a kind of brown paper bag because they couldn't possibly be seen in their context to be reading that newspaper. And it used to be almost a slightly sort of jokey thing. You recognise that people were formed by different schools of opinion or whatever, but there wasn't a kind of out and out antagonism. And I think probably we will reflect in the future that we've been living through the kind of wild west of social media and um you know even elon musk's takeover of twitter given the place that twitter has uh, ended up having uh, in public life uh, all around the world it is an extraordinary thing that it's now uh, a single 
highly, highly wealthy uh, individual who's in control of it. Um, and social media, as you indicated in the introduction, um, is designed to exacerbate these tensions, to create these echo chambers. And I think what's interesting for Christians is to say, actually, I'm a seeker after truth, but I'm going to seek after truth using the fruit of the spirit uh, as I go. And that's a rather fascinating combination, because I think um, there are a lot of people who are feeling incredibly battered by the fact that they've been deplatformed or whatever. And uh, I found some examples where um, actually it's been a sort of unlikely sense of Christian engagement between uh, people who at one level wouldn't agree uh, ostensibly, but they do actually agree about uh, a patient seeking after truth um, uh, in a world where, um, you know, rather more people perhaps are with Pontius Pilate along the lines of they're not really sure what truth is anymore. Thank you. If we think then more narrowly in terms of the church, um, to what extent do you think it is fair to say that Christians can be amongst the worst at disagreeing? Um, I am thinking of um, my work in the past. I used to work in the House of Commons with members of Parliament, including some Christians, and some of the worst letters that they ever received were from Christians. Uh, we've had a question that's come through uh, Menti, which uh, really talks about that, um, given how clear our biblical mandate is to lovingly disagree. Why is the church's public engagement so often shrill and judgmental? What's going on there? How, how would you narrate that? Mm. Um, so, I mean, I'd, I begin um, the book suggesting that actually we've become addicted to something, but whereas um, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, will uh, lead people through a process which begins by admitting that you have a problem, I think too often within the church we don't admit that we've got a problem. Uh, and so uh, either we're not particularly interested in truth, kind of perhaps anything goes, but we really love the idea of being united, or uh, our pursuit of truth becomes unbearably shrill uh, and results in disunity. And um, perhaps naively, I genuinely believe that there is a way through. It might be quite literally a narrow way, um, but um, this kind of patience required. And um, uh, someone suggested to me, well, is it just that, um, you know, just as perhaps your nearest and dearest members of your family or your very closest friend is sort of has permission to see the worst of you and somehow uh, within church we we care so deeply that we feel sufficiently relaxed and open to be that worst kind of person I'm not sure if that's completely true but I think um, the sense of just having failed to see the significance of this. Um, and I think there is a particularly fascinating thing about the willingness of Christians to criticise the church in public on social media in a way in which if you were, you know, an employee of an organisation or even, a, uh, you know, an employee of a, of a charity or an NGO, um, it would be just fairly clear that if the CEO put something out, you know, you wouldn't then see disgruntled employees sort of just filling up the comments with, you know, all the reasons why this particular initiative is a terrible idea. Uh, and yet, you know, I feel for the Church of England central media team and others, you know, who face this kind of thing. And you think, well, what's going on there? This surely isn't um, an overwhelming sense of the fruit of the spirit being at the top of everyone's list of priorities uh, as they seek to engage. Uh, and that's why for me, the John 13, 35 um, observation is so key because Jesus himself says, actually, there's something distinctly special about this love within the church. You know, when people stumble across it, they realize, gosh, this is uh, a way of relating, which is just incredibly special. And so um, there is something deeply tragic about our public face being so distant often from that reality of the love that at best people can encounter within the life of the church. Thank you. Yes, in that answer, you referenced social media. And uh, the question I have, and one of the ones that's raised is the extent to which that is part of the problem. Um, in that the, the line between public and private is blurred there. I mean, it's not really, it's public, but I think often people engage as if it were a private space or a familial space. Um, and to what extent does that amplify 
um, some of the disagreements that we would have anyway um, in, in a way that's just profoundly unhelpful. Any view on that? Yeah, so uh, in my clo <clears throat> closing months at the BBC, I mean, they didn't know it was my closing months, but I did, um, you know, we had a diktat go around that we all needed to sign up for Twitter. So I did this sort of somewhat half-heartedly knowing that I was on my way uh, out the door in a few months time anyway, um, but then uh, thought, oh, well, do I carry on on Twitter at theological college and I decided to come off Twitter I was actually off Twitter for eight years uh, because I thought it was the only way I would ever finish a doctorate um, if I was uh, off Twitter but it was very interesting to reflect on that um, and subsequently to realize that um, there was something of a correlation between people who perhaps after a while you might sidle away from in boorish conversation at the college bar uh, and those same people being really enthusiastic about Twitter and I think there is an element of the kind of stuff that you might say to your mates at the pub and you know well that's okay perhaps but not necessarily great actually but but at least it's just been confined to one conversation in one place and yet of course social media enables the kind of amplification um and i think it, it, it is particularly difficult if you have a particular issue um where you have some degree uh, of knowledge or at least you've put a certain amount of work into it because you might be you know launching this great sort of project that has taken you 10 years and then someone says oh well, that's a load of rubbish isn't it you know on Twitter and 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 there's this sort of instant dismissal which I think is so challenging um but as I say I think we're just at the very beginnings of uh, really thinking through the the ethics the morality um, you know, what is this doing to our brains? Um, you know, are people wanting to, are people able to engage with material at length, think deeply? You know, I think there are some really profound questions about what it is when we're shaped by these constant pings and notifications and distractions. So um, these are big questions for our time, I think. I was really interested in the rules of disagreement or for engagement that you gave us. And as you went through those, I was reflecting on the extent to which Jesus himself conformed to those rules or not. I mean, did he follow your rules, Christopher? Um, and in a way, you you kind of engage with that and sort of, you know, almost challenge that question kind of before it arose. But, you know, if we think about some of the dialogue some of the engagement Jesus has I mean not least in Matthew 23 when he's talking with the scribes and the Pharisees some of the language that he's using is pretty robust whitewashed tombs uh, that he describes them as um, you brood of vipers I mean that isn't kind of nice language is it um, and then of course there's the the incident where he's in the temple um, and that again is it's kind of you know it's, it's pretty robust disagreement um, but then, obviously, encouraged by your what would John Stott do, um, I was reflecting then on his disagreement with Martin Lloyd-Jones about the, the place of evangelicals um, within the church and, and what the appropriate response was. Do you have reflections on that? And I, I suppose particularly I'd be interested in your reflection on the extent to which there can be occasion where civil disobedience is an appropriate response by the Christian in the public space? Uh, to what extent is the example of Jesus being in the temple a type of civil disobedience? So do what you like with that, but there's some reflections. So I think um, too often Christians say, well, Jesus overthrew the tables in the temple. So that can be my approach to a debate at General Synod or the Baptist Union Council or whatever it might be. Um, and I think that there is a fairly straightforward pretty robust case I make for saying that actually we are not straightforwardly called to engage in a kind of biographical imitation of Jesus because you know he had a specific job to do in relation to the religious leaders uh, of his day uh, and then he was inaugurating the kingdom and our job is to make the kingdom more visible and uh, although you know he does say some pretty harsh things to some of the disciples at key points so I'm not saying he's you know always gentle Jesus meek and mild uh, within uh, you know the church the emerging church 
But overwhelmingly, I would say that the picture we have of the church is of this place where this mutual love is fostered uh, and then something wonderful overflows from that. Um, and I always think it's fascinating that, you know, the foot washing that happens just before my key verse on mutual love you know the foot washing includes Peter whose track record at this point is decidedly dodgy and Judas has his feet washed so it is a kind of fascinating picture of um the kind of um well inclusion uh, that Jesus is offering in that sense um in terms of uh, how one looks out to the world uh, actually I think therefore Jesus and the Pharisees probably gives Christians a rather um stronger case for at times emphatic uh, challenge to evil or unjust structures um, than it does for the way in which necessarily we're called to operate within the church. I think that there is an extent to which you can draw some kind of distinction um, there. I think one of the tragedies within the church often is that we almost instantly assume the worst of, you know, a certain kind of Christian. Um, and we assume that they have no real interest in the flourishing of the church ultimately. Uh, and I mean, this is in all directions, you know, that this, you know, that kind of emotion happens, I think. Um, so what is it for us to recover the sense of uh, actually we are in this together um, and with more patience uh, and more mutual understanding actually the church could flourish uh, rather more um and then i think when when one is looking further uh out um it it is this challenge of of balancing um one sense of being a follower of jesus uh, in a world where he's still often unknown and and disregarded and um the call uh, of the herald, you know, to proclaim good news uh, and to proclaim freedom and liberty, uh, often in places that are not willing to hear that message. So it is a balance. Thank you. Uh, to what extent, or, or how, perhaps I should say, best can disciples of Jesus challenge the mindset that says, if you disagree with me, you hate me? Um, the question that's been submitted um, goes along the lines that, you know, often, basically, there is the, you know, there's the all too ready use of dot 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 phobic. So, you know, if you disagree with me on X, then you are necessarily someone who is opposed to me. Do you have some some guidance? To what extent can your, your rules of engagement help us there? Mm. I think so often we have to come back to the sense that the kingdom advances one person at a time. So uh, in so many ways, I think Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman speaks so powerfully to our time because, you know, almost by every uh, possible category, you know, this is, um, you know, two people who should not be uh, engaging. And yet he manages to make that engagement. And in the face of, you know, uh, her angry retweets, as it were, uh, you know, he manages to, to make a meaningful connection. Um, and then this turns out to be transformative for her and in hugely fruitful for the gospel. Um, and I think returning to those um, individual relationships and seeing the value in that um uh, you know and i i've had my own sort of encounter with this um fairly recently and um it's been fascinating to go back to people at an individual level uh and and explain you know well this is what i meant this is how i heard you and suddenly um a, a kind of um tension just kind of dissolves often because of the reality of people you know one-to-one -one honestly seeking to engage um and you know in so many different instances Jesus modeled that beautifully and actually I think we live in a world where to recover that um is is vital actually it feels as if there is a particular problem in our culture just now um certainly compared with recent years um if we were to track the the debate that's been going on through the midterm elections in the united states brexit was referenced earlier as something that's been hugely divisive for people across the uk 
do you have any kind of um, suggestion as to as to why feel things feel particularly fractious, um, particularly divided in our world at this particular point in time? Um, I'm not I'm not pretending to be an expert in all things, and um, but I I do think that that the question I mean we we are still at the very beginnings of understanding, for example the extent to which social media has manipulated election results. You know, I mean, will it be the case that um, certain elections in the US elsewhere, uh, it turns out, have been profoundly manipulated in ways that we don't yet fully understand? That's not because I'm chasing after conspiracy theories, but rather just trying to uh, fully understand the way in which, you know, these algorithms shape attitudes and therefore influence uh, decisions. Of course, that was hugely uh, controversial uh, in relation to Brexit uh, as well. Um, and I think there is something about recognising the power of the local community around the table in love, you know, and, and it, I think it's one of the ironies of the pandemic that it's reminded us uh, of the value, um, for example, of the local church, uh, which may not be a particularly sort of spectacular place at one level, but if it is a place where you can find a countercultural love that um, means that people are in meaningful relationship uh, across divides um you know moving forward in a mutual understanding of course it's not going to be perfect but um actually the family of god is such a powerful thing um i also think for the church it's often about recovering a meaningful sense of connection between where the church is now in all of its variety and you know all the various ways in which it is both glorious and chaotic in different parts of the world but making a kind of meaningful connection back to those heady days of the first chapters of acts and saying well this is the same movement and we we need to be able to make some kind of meaningful connection and um, you know in my work I'm often going to churches that might feel pretty kind of depleted or demoralized and um, sometimes to say actually you know you can almost visualize the line of people uh, you know going out the church door and eventually that line goes all the way back to an upper room in Jerusalem and that's rather an extraordinary but important thing and I think as we make those connections we realise that so many of the issues that dominate our lives now are not ultimately the kind of the deal breakers of human reality, yet the scriptures amazingly speak into the human condition with a continuing freshness, you know, and I, and I think for me that's the legacy of John Stott, the way in which he managed to do that in his time, um, with an ability to connect, you know, across a breadth, um, which I fear so often the sort of the superstar leaders of the church these days are often superstars within a very narrow frame of reference. Um, uh, you know, most people watching the one show, uh, for example, you know, they they don't know of leaders who are speaking up for the gospel beyond, you know, the kind of uh, obvious sort of Anglican establishment iconic figures. Um, and I think there is a there is a desperate need for that kind of connection, really. Thank you for that. You referenced the Acts of the Apostles. If I was to take you a little bit further on in that book, there is the disagreement that takes place, sharp disagreement, we're told, between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark. And so the question is asked, at what point, if ever, are we permitted to break fellowship or distance ourselves from neighbours with whom we seriously disagree? Yes, I'm in, uh, at pains in both my books to uh, point out that's not the question I've written the book to answer. Um, so I'm bracketing it with, with that. But I, I think what one has to say is that within the uh, authority structures that one sees beginning to emerge in Acts chapter 15 uh, and elsewhere, um, one sees the church developing uh, an ability to discern what is within and without the bounds of orthodoxy. And obviously the establishment of the creeds in those early centuries was central to that. Though even there, there is a, you know, there is a kind of irony that we have several creeds rather than one, although probably the Apostles' Creed, you know, is, is um, 
you know, a, a pretty good unifying statement. But of course, many of the hot button issues over which churches divide these days are not addressed in the Apostles' Creed. So uh, that obviously leads to the question of what is adiaphora? You know, what constitutes a, a first or second order issue? And in a sense, I, I hope this isn't a cop out, but what I say to people is, well, actually, whether or not you think this is a first or second order issue, look at the way in which you're approaching this disagreement, because actually, I think there is massive amounts of work to do about how we approach these disagreements, regardless, actually, of whether we ultimately think this is an issue over which fellowship should be broken. Um, but of course, just as scripture rather wonderfully, I think, uh, puts those disagreements in front of us. You know, the, the New Testament doesn't hush up any of these kinds of things. Um, it, you know, it includes particularly, you know, later on towards the end of the New Testament, clear examples where uh, those who are false teachers are not seen appropriately to remain as part of the church. Now, that's a massive discernment. Um, but I think one has to approach a call to loving disagreement, recognising that this is not a kind of endlessly um you know it's not sort of endlessly loving and generous you know that there has to be uh, a boundary but uh my primary interest is not where that boundary is but actually the kind of people we are uh, as we seek to have the disagreements that may lead us to that boundary and and in a sense for me you know there is a uh an irony but also i suppose i genuinely hope it that there may be something of God's timing in this work coming out at a point where, you know, the denomination I'm part of um, is convulsing over a question that that may well lead to a certain kind of separation and that it pains me deeply on all kinds of levels, um, but partly because of the way I see people so often approaching this disagreement in a way in which it seems to me doesn't look or sound recognisably Christian a lot of the time. And I think um there is a place to to lament that uh, as well as uh, face the issues and 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 interrogate them you talk about your denomination christopher and therefore i feel at liberty to ask you a question about it um or oh, it's not my question it's um one of the questions that's been put on menti this evening it's a blocker anglicans in particular are renowned for fudging things it can create a very bland middle way tolerant but perhaps fearful of taking a principled stand any thoughts? Well, I think there is an element of WWJSD uh, in this, um, because let's be honest, there are a lot more evangelicals within the Church of England today because of the stance John Stott took to encourage evangelicals to remain within the church. And I would say I believe that the Church of England is enriched immeasurably by um, not merely the diversity, but the fact that um, that is, you know, part of um, the life of the church. And I worry deeply that um, one apparently neat solution would be some kind of differentiation that effectively means um, you know separate churches and 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 I feel this deeply in part because uh, through my work as a BBC reporter I travelled uh, extensively and saw quite a lot of different places in the world where Anglican disunity uh, was being played out um, and uh, I worry that the Church of England is currently sort of looking over the edge of a rather high cliff um, and what's happened in the United States uh, over the last 20 years is a rather uh, sorry um, warning, really, for us. Um, so whether or not, um, you know, the Church of England can find a way through, but I, I think what's intriguing is that I think there's less of an appetite for fudge at the moment, uh, perhaps particularly because of a sense um, on all sides of the debate over women in ministry, for example, that that has not necessarily been handled in a way that ultimately um, has seen the church um, flourish in the way that had been hoped in terms of relationships between different parts of the church. And so, uh, it, but, but, you know, it's a, it, it feels like a pretty bleak 
time, I think, for unity within the Church of England at the moment. Um, and I think that holding together of unity and truth is, is this massive challenge. And generally speaking, people will probably bang a drum for one rather more than the other. And I think um, WWJSD, uh, I think John Stott, uh, I imagine, would be speaking the truth winsomely but clearly and indeed actually I think it would be very interesting to ask Vaughan Roberts whether uh, in writing his response to the Bishop of Oxford uh, whether he was in some way inspired by the way in which John Stott conducted himself. Um, very interesting thank you I was reflecting seeing the list of previous speakers who gave the the lecture at lecturers who John Stott invited during his lifetime. It was interesting that Malcolm Muggeridge, for example, was one of those speakers who um, John would have clearly disagreed with about a whole range of doctrinal issues, but nonetheless offered a, a, a space and there was a generosity in the approach and a desire to engage. And similarly, I remember um, being told that at the time that the, the David Jenkins row flared up around the resurrection of Jesus, John Stott's uh, first response when invited to give public comment um, was to go inside, pick up the phone and telephone him to try and understand what he was saying and what he was trying to say before then making public comment. So it does seem there's a lot to, to learn from. You talk about the fact that um, sometimes we, we separate belief and character, but in fact they're intertwined. And I wonder to what extent you think some of the problems that we have today um, and some of the poor ways in which we model loving disagreement are because precisely we've separated those two things. No, I mean, I think it's a huge problem. And in a sense, it's, it's why I found the study I did of the New Testament so interesting in this respect, because uh, it, it just kind of reminds you how much, particularly for Paul, but actually by no means exclusively for Paul, there was this constant sense of what is the character of these people um, who are being formed. But also, um, it's not the kind of rictus grin, I'm okay, I'm a, you know, I'm a Christian and it's all lovely, um, but rather um, I'm receiving the Holy Spirit and and therefore at best actually my character is a kind of overflow from God's work within me um you know you you can't strive after the fruit of the Spirit you have to receive them um and um and I think that's a hard lesson um in some churches because I think sadly there are some churches that are rather kind of robbed of joy uh, and hope <laughs> and um and so it 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 can be quite a delicate thing um it's something i find fascinating in the work that i now do where i will you know routinely pitch up at a church that i know you know pretty little about um and you're tasked with you know some kind of day of spiritual refreshment if you like um but often to gently try and discover what are the spiritual fruits that have long felt absent uh, in this place? And what would it mean to think that progress is not about you striving harder? And post pandemic, the number of churches where, you know, rotors are impossible to fill, where, you know, you've lost 20, 30% of the congregation that wasn't that big, you know, pre pandemic. Um, so striving is just not gonna work because, in many of these churches, you know, you've got people who are now, who were already pretty elderly and are another three years older. And, you know, the health conditions they already had are a little bit worse. And, you know, all these kind of realities. Um, so actually to say, this is a God who gives good gifts <laughs> to his children when they ask, and he will give good, good gifts to 12 or even 11, you know, pretty unpromising people shortly after his death and resurrection. Um, and so therefore, actually, he can give really good gifts to you lot in this drafty church, you know, that has felt somewhat overlooked and disheartened. Um, and from that place, you know, from that sort of inner transformation, um, something wonderful happens. Um, I mean, when I was, um, you know, procrastinating trying to read this lecture, I came across um, uh, 
a, a site that had highlighted some of the, the friend star. Is it Matthew Perry? You'll know this. Uh, <laughs> so the friend star is, you know, who had a drug overdose for many, Matthew Perry, Matthew Perry, um, I'm just on the button with popular culture, as you can tell. Um, but um, the Mockingbird blog uh, run by the Zal brothers, so uh, Simeon Zal, who, um, who is uh, a lecturer in theology at Cambridge and then has uh, two brothers in the States, it's worth looking up. Um, this absolutely remarkable testimony of um, Matthew Perry, who had been virtually obliterated by drug addiction, I mean to an, the most extraordinary extent, deciding to pray again uh, and having an experience of the presence of God, which, you know, in his words, uh, he was sober for two years following that experience. And as I understand it in his autobiography, you know, he writes about that as a sort of utterly defining moment and you know what sometimes in the UK church I think we sort of we don't spend enough time celebrating those kind of defining moments for people um, and saying you know even in the sort of the ordinariness and the sort of low level passive aggression or demoralization of your local church life the risen Christ can come in the power of his spirit and bring hope and renewal and refreshment and that can change you it can give you a sort of renewed taste that there is such a thing as Christ-like character and it's actually quite a nice thing to grow in that and it doesn't have to be about striving but it is about receiving a gift and feeling drawn to live a holy life and of course the culture will say that's narrow and restrictive and judgmental and awful but I think again you know to to be encouraged in this being the Christian life. And then for, you know, whether it's your, your mission, your evangelism, your witness, to come from that place of, of overflow. Um, that to me at least is a kind of attractive vision of the Christian life, which you can take into your workplace or the play group or wherever it might be but there is a spiritual reality uh, at its heart and there's a sense of gift rather than striving um now that's not the end of the story you know and there are boundaries and challenges and disciplines um but it seems to me you know with the Samaritan woman or Zacchaeus or various other people that Jesus encounters it begins with that astonishing astonishing sense of who he is and the kind of transformation that he can prompt. Thank you. You talk about the fact that we receive the fruit of the Spirit and that we don't get it through striving. At the same time, disciples of Jesus are tasked to train to be disciples, and we have spiritual disciplines to grow in Christ-likeness. I wonder to what extent we need to train to lovingly disagree. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it, and, and it is, of course, a uh, uh, an important you know it's important to strike an appropriate balance um and 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 for me and one of the one of the things that i uh i i do in i have to get better at sort of plugging the book don't i paul so you know in the book and in the unity course people can have the opportunity uh to but to think about well what is it to apply the fruit of the spirit or almost to do a kind of fruit of the spirit audit uh in relation to the way in which I'm approaching this particular disagreement uh, in my life. So if I'm in the midst of a row about whether the pews should be removed or not, um, actually to what extent, if I were to go through the fruit of the spirit, um, and therefore I think part of the training is, is to uh, self-examine oneself in relation to these inevitably, these occasions of disagreement that we're coming across. Um, and, uh, you know, if we do find ourselves uh, in that kind of situation, asking, well, am I doing the Christ-like things? Um, often it is as simple as saying, have I actually forgiven that person? <laughs> you know, and therefore is my approach flowing from a place of grace uh, and peace um, or not? Uh, because so often we we just expect this kind of low level passive aggressive way of being to extend through the workplace and church life and uh, I think at best 
the church is called to model something better, um, but it does involve each of us at the level of our conscience, if you like, uh, choosing to seek to consider how we can improve in this, yeah. It can feel perhaps especially at the moment that the church is vulnerable when it comes to modeling this because our track record frankly is appalling in recent years there have been high profile examples of abuse within the church and organizations that are part of the church um how then can we do that to what extent do we have like the moral authority or ability to to model this loving disagreement given our track record yeah, and I think um, often people's engagement with institutions can feel very different at the kind of national or abstract level compared with how they engage with a person that they know who may happen to be associated with that institution. Now, of course, the, the real tragedy is if they happen to know someone who is uh, abusive. Um, but I think attending to those questions it begins in the individual heart, doesn't it? And and in a sense, that's part of my point about remembering the astonishing spread of Christianity in the first place, you know, without the gift of stadiums, I mean, without PowerPoint and, you know, without amplification. I mean, how did this movement ever get off the ground? And, you know, reminding ourselves that so many of the things that we regard as essential props in ministry, you know, were simply not there. So what was happening? Well, actually, person after person, heart after heart, was being probably rather more than even strangely warmed. You know, there was really quite a lot of you know heat uh, present, uh, and lives were being transformed. And um, uh, you know, uh, we moved to Telford a year ago to be part of. Um, to be located where the Ministry of, of Resource um, has its office. Um, and so we're plant, part of a new uh, Anglican church plant in the heart of Telford. And there are all kinds of challenges about, you know, planting a new church uh, in um, a place that I think it vies with Hull as the place with the least church going of any uh, UK town. Um, but what is absolutely glorious is seeing people come to faith seeing people who have absolutely no idea about the Christian faith, you know, and probably generationally uh, within their families, little or no idea about the Christian faith, coming to faith. And of course, if you're a kind of, you know, slightly cynical, wizened old Christian, you know, who's been around the block a little bit, um, it's particularly good for you to be reminded of this. Um, and, you know, sadly within Within the Church of England, one of the problems is if you've got a church where it's really a very long time since someone came to Christian faith, because if you haven't got that story in your local community, um, then there's there's no way of of people as the Samaritan woman did telling others their story. And yet, if one person's heart is strangely warmed, you know, it has this it can have this amazing snowball effect. And I think in part, it's about us recovering hope and faith uh, for that. I don't see you as wizened, Christopher. I, oh, yeah, sorry. I don't. Um, Christopher, is there anyone, John Stutt aside, that you look at and think they modeled this, they modeled this really powerfully and that that, that person therefore could be a public figure, could be someone simply personal to you um, is an encouragement and challenge. Um, and, and then a, a final question um, is around the, the ability of the, the church to be this restorative um, presence, this, this reconciling presence within the world. How practically might local churches take steps towards loving disagreement and also how might that look like look outside the context of gathered church into the church scattered where we are for most of our time so i don't say this because she used to sit in your chair but i do think that elaine stalkey uh, is someone who um really modeled this in many many years of patient service within the general synod um meaning that 
evangelicals couldn't be written off, you know, uniquely as the nasty party. Um, you know, I sometimes think someone needs to kind of stand up in the way Theresa May did for the Conservatives and remind, you know, various factions of the church that they are often perceived as the kind of nasty party. But Elaine was amazing, I think, and still is, at uh, engaging across the breadth of the church, rooted in scripture, but very much uh, open to the world. Uh, and certainly, I've learned a lot from from that way uh, of being. Um, and in a sense that, I mean, you know, partly I wanted to emphasise the way in which John Stott saw Ephesians as this, you know, this model of what it is that we are hoping for. But that's why I wanted to quote the prayer for the for the Ephesians, but in effect, the prayer for the church. Um, <laughs> there are too many people who, if they're honest, have kind of lost faith in the church. And if you're not able to be fired up, as it were, in church in some way, to then be sent out week by week, um, I think after a while, and of course, you know, these days you can go online or you can listen to a podcast or whatever, but it is not the same as that unique fellowship found, you know, in community, um, which then means that as you go, you know, to those water cooler moments or whatever they are uh, these days, uh, you do so as an ambassador um, for the King of Kings. And I think to be able to live out that call to loving disagreement um, is profoundly related to the health of churches uh, and the sense in which people feel the church is the place that they are resourced intellectually, socially, but primarily spiritually for the Christian life, you know, so that they can uh, overflow with hope to, to others. Christopher, thank you so very much indeed. We've been really encouraged, we've been informed, we've been challenged by what you've shared with us this evening. And thank you too for engaging so graciously and fully with the questions that uh, we have asked you this evening. Um, we're so grateful. Would you please show your appreciation to Christopher Lambeau? Thank you.